Welcome, this is a recorded session of the Post-Quantum Cryptography Conference of the PKI Consortium. This conference would not have been possible without our sponsors in Trust, HID Global, and PQ Shield, and the organizational support of the Post-Quantum Cryptography Working Group of the PKI Consortium, in particular in Trust, Logius, TNO, and CWI. Yes, that brings us to our uh, second presentation of this uh, session uh, by uh, Volker Krummel. Uh, Volker Krummel is currently serving as the chapter lead for post-quantum cryptography, uh, cryptography at Utimatico. He holds a PhD in cryptography and uh, with over two decades of experience in cryptography and IT security, uh, he contributed to the advancement of many secure digital systems. In his current role, Volker uh, continues to address the threat of uh, post by quantum computing uh, to cryptographic si systems. And today we will talk about uh, stateful hash-based signatures. Please uh, welcome uh, Volker to the stage. <clears throat> Thank you very much for the nice introduction and the opportunity to speak here. Um, my topic is stateful hash-based signatures, a, a topic that is, uh, let's say, very actual from the, also from the application perspective. And I want to, to give some kind of summary, uh, what is the current state of these stateful hash-based signatures in the, in the real world, and uh, enhance it with some kind of uh, experiences and uh, lessons learned we, we did in the, in the field while uh, implementing this stuff, uh, not as an, as an, uh, pure algorithm, but uh, to implement them in, in full use cases. So <clears throat> please keep in mind, this is, uh, let's say, uh, um, a viewpoint from the practice. So um, statements we give here, or I give here, are my personal statements and open for discussions and happy to, to discuss them with you. So you can approach me every time you want, uh, even during the night, to discuss these, these things, because we are always looking for new approaches and, and uh, improving the uh, <coughs> solutions for, for customers. So the short agenda, uh, short introduction, what are stateful hash-based signatures so that everybody gets the main principle of this one and then I talk a bit about limitations and about the handling of the state. Um, <clears throat> so starting with the basics, um, not sure if this is really relevant here in this group, but as we see in the field, uh, not everybody's aware of what a hash function is and what a cryptographic hash function is. So just start like this to get the, the basic idea. So uh, cryptographic hash function is, uh, let's say the basic principle is you, you put in a very huge message into this function and you get a digest with a fixed length. Um, typically 256 bits now uh, could be enhanced and, and uh, even larger. Um, cryptographic in this sense means we have uh, <clears throat> several properties in this uh, this functions. One is the one-way function, so that way I can go into one direction but not uh, revert the process. And uh, one also very important uh, process here or property here is the collision resistance. So it's even hard to find two inputs that that uh, two different inputs that hash to the same digest. And there are several other, let's say, um, properties of cryptographic hash functions. Um, but these are then the most important ones. So how can we use a cryptographic hash function to build a, <coughs> a signature scheme? So these are the, the, the very basic approaches. So if we start with a value x0 that we, for example, randomly choose from a, from a certain space, we hash this to get the value x1. Um, we can enhance this process, of course, x, uh, hash this x1 to get the x2 and, and further on. So build a hash a chain of, of hash values. Um, and if you remember the, the cryptographic property of, of one way, for example, we cannot go backwards. So if I get the, to know the x0, I can compute all the hash functions, uh, hash values. But if I only get the x3 value, for example, I cannot go back. So <clears throat> if we consider um, these values, let's say uh, the x3 value as a public value and the, the x0 uh, to x2 to so some kind of private values, we could build up a, <coughs> a signature scheme like this. So if we have three different messages, uh, 0, 1, and 2, um, we could, for example, um, if we want to sign the message 1, we just simply publish the message 1 together with the x1. Yeah? 
uh, with this value. So, and what the verifier can do at the end is um, he knows the public value x3 and he gets to know the x1 and uh, the corresponding message. And what he has to verify is if I iterate the hash chain starting from the x1 value two times, then I will I have to end up with the value x3. If I end up with x3, then the verification is successful. If not, then there's some uh, mistake and the verification was, was not successful. So this is a very, very basic principle how to generate uh, signature schemes. It's the basic principle. There are only some technical subtleties uh, in this. I, I want to skip in this talk um, because they are not, uh, let's say, of, of concern for, for the talk here, um, but they are efficiently solved and uh, not, uh, let's say, the biggest problem with these, with these things. What we have to have in mind is, of course, we can only use these hash change only once because I, if I release one, uh, one um, hash value, then of course I, uh, I could reuse uh, parts of the chain to, to generate new um, signatures. So this is the, what we call the OTS scheme. Yeah? It's a uh, one-time signature scheme. Um, <clears throat> we could use this approach directly to, to build up systems that can sign arbitrary number of messages. Um, but it's very inefficient because of uh, we need to establish, let's say for each signature, we have to establish an, an OTS, full OTS setup. Um, especially we need the private keys and especially we need also for each uh, OTS uh, a different public key. And this is of course what makes, uh, what generates a huge problem for, for many of the use cases so far. So what we want to have is a single public key for all the OTS schemes that we set up. And the basic uh, mechanism that we that is used here is to build up a tree, some kind of hash tree or Merkle tree. So combine two of these schemes, the public keys, uh, to generate new nodes, and then continue this process until we get up with a, uh, with a common public key for all of the OTS schemes. So this would enable us to publish one key, one public key, and then do, in this case, eight signatures with a different OTS scheme, and they verify, can be verified with the, with the same uh, public key here. So <clears throat> the, the verification is, becomes a bit uh, more complex, uh, but not that much. So as we see here, for example, if we want to use OTS2 um, to sign a message, we have to enhance the signature with certain values from the tree, so to be able uh, for the verification process to generate the public key from that. Yeah. So if we consider the, the, the yellow values here, if we add these values to the, um, to the signature, you can climb up the tree, producing the green values here to climb up uh, to the root, to the public key, and then can, you can verify the signature. So very simple, very uh, clear, let's say, approach. Um, we have only two two challenges at this point. Um, we have, uh, let's say, a, a limited number of signatures. So you have to know in advance how many signatures you want to, to compute in your whole lifetime. Um, <clears throat> and of course, and this is the more subtle one, you have to keep track of uh, which key you already used, the OTS keys, um, and not to reuse um, an OTS key again, because this would lead to, to uh, forgery, um, potential forgeries for, for attackers, and then, of course, uh, reduce or completely eliminate your, your secure. <clears throat> so let's say for a summary uh, pros and cons of this, of this approach, um, it's, let's say, on the, on the pro side, we have a very, very efficient mechanism in the sense of sizes of signatures and public keys. Uh, we have a very, let's say, basic structure of the algorithm, so it's a well mature uh, level of security we can gain with these algorithms. Um, so typically nobody questions the security of hash-based uh, signatures because the underlying functions, the underlying hash functions are very well uh, designed and, and um, believed to be secure. We have more advances here that may be not that clear from the from the definition of algorithms. We have uh, standardization is already done, as uh, Bill said in this, uh, and Dusty in, this, uh, in their talk uh, before. 
Um, there are already standards for two of these algorithms, so you can directly implement and use them. And what is very, very helpful in the practices, uh, they are already, <coughs> since they are standardized, um, they, they are all re uh, also recommended to be a one-to-one -one substitution. So if you plan to migrate or to set up a new use case today, and you start with this uh, hash, stateful hash-based signature, you can directly use them and that's it. Uh, with all the other algorithms, it's, it's recommended to use them in a hybrid mode. So you combine them together with the legacy or classical algorithm, which, depending on the use case, can, uh, raises some concerns and, and uh, raises some, some limitations. So, sounds very good, sounds very, very cool for these uh, stateful hash based signatures. So, is it, let's say, the holy grail? Is it solved? There are some, some cons, of course, uh, I mentioned already before. So, firstly, you have to know the, the, the number of the, the signatures you can do is limited. Yeah? So, and limited in the sense that you have to know in advance how many signatures you want to do with this key. And uh, you have to generate all these, let's say, OTS keys. So it's, it's not like a finite set that we had before. A lattice is an infinite space and we have a finite base and we can generate all the keys virtually. But here we really have to do some computation in advance. Yeah? So this is really a limitation. Um, but for signature schemes, you can think of, uh, if you have a use case, you should maybe know how many signatures that you, you plan to do. Because it's a good practice that uh, all the keys have a lifetime and you should change them after a certain amount of signatures or a certain, uh, after a certain date. Uh, the second one is the, this is what we call the stateful so that you have to keep track which OTS key was already used and which is not, was not used. This again is on the, on the first thinking, it's also not that complicated because um, you can really implement this stuff very efficiently so that you have a single order of the keys. So all you have to keep track of is a counter. So you, you need to know, okay, this counter is, is uh, with uh, the size of two and then the next is three and so forth. It should be easy. Um, we also use this, for example, counter handling in other cryptographic scenarios, counter modes for, for symmetric encryption, for example. Um, seems to be similar at the first sight. What we see or learn later a bit is it's a bit more complex here in, in the real world applications. <coughs> so I'm not sure if uh, everybody is aware of, uh, of some of these great movies uh, about the Holy Grail. Uh, there's a saying, uh, the Holy Grail can do anything, but you, you should not move it or you should not pass the, the, the great seal with it. Eh? Otherwise, bad things happen. It's, uh, yeah, from a, one of the great movies, uh, Indiana Jones movies, um, that also has, okay, uh, considers some of these, let's say, drawbacks of, of even great, uh, great approaches. Why is it a problem? Because typically you see uh, use cases like these ones, so distributed use cases over the planet, space, whatever, so you have different sites where you have different uh, functionalities and of course you want to be as flexible as possible with your use case. So generate uh, signatures at the headquarter, at the manufacturing site, as maybe even uh, um, deployed to supply chain, whatever. <clears throat> so and with this, and if you think about the, the limitations we, we saw so far, for example, the state handling, there's not a single counter anymore. Or, or you have to solve the problem of maintaining a single counter over di different uh, different um, sites. And since the risk uh, or the damage that you risk if you if you do a mistake here is complete loss of security, this is uh, of a very big concern for these use cases. Um, before going deeper into that, let me let me just show you a picture about the, let's say, the different sizes of, uh, of uh, public key and uh, signatures compared to other algorithms, PQC and legacy algorithms. And there you can get an idea and, and imagine why people, uh, so the, on, the, on the application side, like these stateful hash-based signatures. Um, because the signatures and the, um, the public keys are very small compared to the other ones. 
Uh, we see here that this is a logarithmic uh, scale, the y scale. So, <clears throat> um, so from here, this is the size of 100 bytes, and this is uh, already going to the to the 10,000 and to the 100,000 bytes. Yeah? So you see these stateful hash based signatures. These are the red ones here. Both uh, are quite nicely in the sense of public key size which is uh, one of the, let's say, uh, most important property for certain use cases, the size of the public key. If you compare these to, let's say, RSA or even uh, Dinitium now, we see here, the sizes are much, much larger. And yeah, if you are in a restricted environment, um, people tend to, to first look at the, at the stateful hash based signatures and see how we can solve uh, the limitations there. And for, let's say, certain use cases, you can just draw a rectangle or whatever shape you like to see which algorithms are in scope for your use case. For example, for the, uh, for the firmware, firmware update over the air, uh, the public key size is, is essential. So you limit yourself to key size below 500. Then you see uh, all the algorithms that are in, in the range and, and uh, could be looked at. And for other use cases, you may be a bit more flexible. Huh? But this is, let's say, the way a practitioner will, will approach this, this topic firstly. Yeah? So what is possible, uh, what is in range, and uh, what I have to look at. <clears throat> OK, so at this point, maybe you get an idea what the, what the topic is and, and what the, maybe the concern is. Now I want to share some thoughts and some experiences uh, regarding these limitations. Firstly, for the uh, limitate, uh, limitation of the, the number of keys. Um, if you s just simplify this to the real world, it's just, okay, you add another risk if you use uh, stateful hash based signatures. Namely, the risk that you, at a certain point, run out of signatures. So you have to deal with that. If you can deal with that, and this, there are certain ways, of course, to do it, it's fine to use uh, stateful hash based signatures. Um, the second is, of course, this is a bit more technical. If you are, your estimation of the, of the signatures you, you want to use is, should be optimal, so it should be close to the, to the real number that you use because the size of the signature varies with the, with the, uh, the, the number of, of, of potential signatures. <clears throat> so you, you cannot just simply say, okay, I go up to the, to, to the 40, uh, 48 or what, whatever, um, then you end up with maybe inefficient uh, size of signatures. So uh, this approach works quite well in, in use cases that are more or less static. For example, if you, if you think about a root CA that fairly signs uh, only a few keys and uh, less over, over a long period of time, this is a good advice to use stateful hash based signatures. Um, also the other case, if you have ad hoc things, so where you know, okay, I, I use an, an hat or key and uh, only use it for maybe 20, 20 signatures, something really, really agile. You could also think about having this because then the, the state handling will not be uh, of a big concern. Um, but let's say there are certain use cases in the field that are really, really nice and relevant for, for these algorithms. Um, there are two options, let's say, to, to walk at least two options to, to work around this limitation. You could enhance the, the tree structure I showed you before with uh, another layer of trees. So the, the signing keys in the end, in the, in the, uh, in the, on the leaves of the tree, do not sign the message directly, but sign a key that is a root of another tree. So you can build up a, a whole forest with this one. Always, of course, with the drawback, you enlarge the signatures uh, and lose a lot of the efficiency. So you have to, to, to learn this in advance. And uh, the second one, and this is people go first with, is of course, yeah, we, we change the key after we exhaust all the keys, which is of course good practice to have a procedure like this in, in place. But there are always some kind of barriers in the minds uh, doing this as a, as a plan B, uh, plan A, sorry. As a plan B, this is always fine, but a plan A is always a bit, <clears throat> creepy. So let's say if 
if there are other thoughts about this, feel free to contact me or to 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 raise these in, in the questions. Um, how we can we can deal with that more efficiently. The second uh, limitation um, is about the state handling itself. So you remember we, we have to to check at every point. We have to ensure that we do not reuse a, a, an OTS key um, twice. And the problem here is that typically, if people want to distribute keys from one side to the other, they, they use the so-called backup and restore mechanism. So they generate a key on an HSM hardware security module. This is a cryptographic unit where you can do everything nicely and securely. You back up the key, transport the backup to another HSM and uh, put it in there. And the problem is, of course, here, if you do what you should do, do a backup after the initialization, uh, then you progress uh, with your operating, you use some of these OTS keys, and then at a certain point you, you replay um, or you restore the, the backup then of course you fell prey to maybe reuse uh, the first OTS keys. And this is of course a very bad practice and you lose all the security. So we see two options here. Um, either you adapt this procedure, enhance it, so that you do some kind of backup and then readjust the state afterwards, which is risky of course, because then the security does not rely at, uh, to the secrecy of the algorithm, uh, to, the, to the key and not uh, to the security of the algorithm, but also to your manual process, which is from a cryptographic point always not advisable. <coughs> um, the second, uh, or, or let's say two, two thoughts about this one is, in principle, this should be okay, and this is why people tend to use, uh, to, to go with this strategy, because typically you know what you have what you sign and what you have signed. For firmware, it makes completely sense that you don't have an, an, a server that signs everything and by accident, one of the signatures is done with your, with your firmware state. Um, but you should really have a tight bookkeeping of, of how you use the signature key. The other, uh, let's say, thought about this is, uh, you saw that this is a, some kind of tree structure comparable to a PKI structure somehow. And we have some kind of revoking key mechanism on that. Eh? So there are also, let's say, in certain use cases, the potential uh, to use some kind of revoking of these keys if they ever use twice, um, which is also, of course, recommended as plan B or C at least. Eh? Um, <clears throat> second option, and this is, of course, what we recommend, is to have some kind of proper state handling uh, mechanism. And I'll come to this in a second. Uh, yes, let's skip this one over, go to the state handling. So the problem with the state and with the state handling is uh, the bookkeeping of what key I was used and what not is, is complex in distributed um, uh, scenarios. And we have, uh, we list here six design properties of how a state handling uh, mechanism should work and what a state handling mechanism should have uh, in case of uh, being a good solution and a good this, uh, yeah, solution for this problem. Of course, we have to transfer state information, but we have to do it in an authentic and confidential way. This is clear. There shouldn't be any, let's say, cryptographic <coughs> weakness in, in that. And for this one, we, we suggest and we recommend and we use uh, symmetric uh, encryption because we don't want to go into this trap securing a very major PQC algorithm with a PQC algorithm that is maybe not that major. So uh, then uh, it's a, it's a uh, egg and hen problem. So um, we uh, recommend to use symmetric encryption for that because we get the best, <coughs> best security on that. Um, we recommend to have a secure and, and a trust, establish a trust relationship between HSMs, between the uh, HSMs that are allowed to use um, state and information and the signature scheme. We have to, of course, ensure that, uh, let's say, if we transfer state forth and back, there's no, no replay possible, of course, um, to undermine the security of this. And there are certain other, let's say, properties that are a bit more from the practical side. So, for example, um, prepare for offline data. So we don't, what we don't have, want to have is a one-to-one -one communication from one HSM to the other, 
So this is not an atomic operation. We have some kind of export of state information and import at a certain point of time uh, later. But we need the security that the export and the import is, let's say, uh, in secure in the way that each OTS key is only uh, exists once in this in this whole setup. Yeah? And what I mean with that, short short animation for this one, uh, if if we have let's say these the three sites, so headquarter manufacturing uh, sites A and B, um, we have let's say logical connections between these. This could be network connection, could be USB, manual transport, whatever doesn't matter. And uh, as an option, we also have some kind of external key storage on that. So it's it's not a, a direct communication between HSM uh, between HSMs. So how could it work? So firstly, as I said before, we have this trust relationship. That means we establish secret keys uh, in all these HSMs. <clears throat> and then we can start generating OTS key setup um, at a certain uh, HSM. And then we can transfer this OTS keys in an arbitrary, um, let's say, uh, packages to, to all the different HSMs or even to the optional key storages. And the, the approach and the, the um, uh, advantage of having an external key storage is that you, we will see it in, in a second, uh, but you have an unlimited, let's say, uh, memory and you have an unlimited um, um, accessibility um, and not blocking HSM operations and stuff like that. So if you are in this operating of HSMs, you, you will really like it, huh? <clears throat> the external key storage. And of course, if, if we then go up and operate with these keys, so you use the OTS keys in signing uh, during, during the um, manufacturing process, for example, if you have an, uh, an, the risk that I mentioned before of exhausting keys at one side, you can simply transfer uh, keys from one side to the other. Of course, already limited to the, to the maximum amount, but uh, you, you can transfer as, as arbitrary as you want to. As you want to. Um, if, a, if you want to shut down a site, you can retransfer this, these keys back to the, to the headquarter or to the, to the different manufacturing, uh, manufacturing site. Um, of course, security, uh, the, the transport, the, the messages that we, that we send has to be secure and protected against replay attacks so that there's no, no risk of, of uh, attacking uh, this protocol. And one, one very interesting uh, thought from, from customers is, of course, hey, if I make a mistake, if I have a faulty application, I exhaust all my, my keys and then I'm done. Uh, this, for example, is also addressed very well with this external key storage. So, for example, if this would happen in manufacturing site A, you may exhaust the OTS key 7, but not the OTS keys 5 and 6 because they are in, in the external key storage. And this is also the second uh, advantage of this external key storage. If in case one of your HSMs burns down, is stolen, whatever, you lose the keys that are stored inside of this HSM, but not the others. And this is what uh, I think helps a lot in, in operating um, <coughs> HSMs like that. So this is the main idea how we suggest to, so to address the problem of, of uh, statefulness. So what, what you cannot um, fully or 100% of course solve is if an HSM is destroyed, the content of the HSM is lost. That's, that's for sure, but you can, you can arrange the amount of, of data that is lost. <clears throat> so in principle, with this approach, we, we reduce the, the problem of handling a global state to handling the states locally on, on each side, which should be enough for, for most of the use cases. And of course, if this is not an option for you, at least this is not an option for you, then you should do this, Re follow this recommendation, eliminate the state. So go, then you should go for, for a different algorithm. Uh, at least uh, Sphinx Plus, for example, is one of, of, the, of the candidate. This is also based on hash functions, but also as we heard before, uh, there's a lot of, uh, there are a lot of other uh, algorithms. Um, that are, let's say, suitable for, for certain use cases. So just to, to recover here and to compare these three options, so we have three options, either adapt your backup restore procedure, then 
you have a good, very good performance, but the security, of course, is lowered because you are rely on your process. If you go for the uh, proper state handling, you keep the same efficiency, but you you raise your your security or keep your security level. And if you go for the stateless algorithm, may you may lose some kind of performance. So it's it's not a, a scaled thing here. You lose some kind of uh, performance, but keep the very high security because you simply do not have to care about state handling. Yeah, and then this this uh, concludes my my talk. So as a summary, um, what do you think about stateful hash based signatures? If, if you if you think about using this one and, and research about this one, it's always start with a with a uh, well defined uh, use case on on a, on a certain level. So it's not a good thing to start and to to look for for a PQC algorithm that solves all your problems in your company or in your in your field. You really have to go and start with a use case per use case, and you need really to consider um, technical limitations and the technical uh, properties of your use case. So, and to make a good decision if this one is a stateful hash based signature algorithm is, is good for you and, and manageable uh, or not. We see that these use cases exist in the in the field, so definitely. Um, but you need again the advice analyze, and if you need help, contact people who know about this. Um, the stateful hash based signatures still provide a very or the best ratio of, of performance in the sense of sizes of keys and, and signatures, for example. Um, and the proper state handling, as I described here, is is possible and will, let's say, solve 99% uh, percent of, of the problems that you see and you encounter with handling of states. And yeah, if you are interested in somehow we can do some kind of demo on, on the request uh, on, on uh, because on our HSMs we, we do implement this the state handling stuff. So if you uh, want to use uh, HSMs, you can use this this mechanism to distribute keys. And with this one, I will close and hope not to consume too much time from my slot. But it seems everything's okay. Huh? <laughs> Thank you. So we even have a couple of minutes for questions. So uh, great on uh, on timing. <laughs> uh, so I already see two hands raised. Oh, and a third one. Please go ahead. Can you use imbalance trees for the uh, stateful hashes? Yes. So you could have some sort of scheme where, like, the second half of of signatures you generate is now longer, and then the second half of that is even longer. And so on. So you never really run out of keys. You just get longer and longer signatures. Uh, yes, I think this is not covered by this by the standard, uh, but in technically this is possible. Yes, of course. Yeah. I'd like to uh, ask something more about the same kind of question. In a typical implementation, how many keys do you have? How many signatures do you have? There, there is no typical, yeah? so you can you can um, arrange. So, for example, if you have a firmware signing use case where you uh, release, let's say, two, three, four firmwares per year, you can estimate that you, for the next twenty years, use something like less than hundred signatures. Mm -hmm. Then, of course, you multiply it by a security factor. Maybe you you have to do change something. Uh, then you end up maybe with a thousand thousand signatures. So very limited in the in the, in the scope, and um, you have to. If you start then to generate the key, um, you're limited to this number. That's it. So if you ever let's say go to the next um, or, or exhaust all these keys, then you have to go to the next let's say um, generation of key. Okay. The reality is just an extremely small number of signatures. Thousand signatures are not that much. Uh, not that much for these use cases. So yeah. stateful hash based signatures are definitely nothing for end user communication, for example. This is I would not recommend it. Okay, thank you. So um, if I'm understand it correctly, uh, the continuity of operations is of paramount importance. Uh, would it be feasible to um, issue uh, these keys uh, by pairs? That once you have you, you re, uh, used all the uh, the keys from uh, the 
first certificate. Then you switch over to the next certificate with the obligation to have some kind of reaction time. Say within three months, you need to renew and get three or uh, two, two yeah. new certificates. Yes, this this idea is is, is possible. Um, this is let's say key generation so or key rotation principle. Um, if you think about use cases where you have IoT, for example, so you you put in the public key into a very limited device and then send it to the to the orbit. Then it's hard um, to change the key afterwards. So you have to, uh, to to inject the key directly while during the manufacturing side. Yeah? And then, of course, you it, it's a good practice to have several key generations at hand. So if it's something is broken, if something changes, whatever, you can switch at least to the to the next generation. This is definitely possible. Doubles the size of the public key, for example, yeah? but still. Um, depends on the, on the use case, on the technical part. So you can store the second generation maybe in a different type of, of memory than the, the first generation. And, yeah, that's okay. Yeah, for, first of all, uh, thank you for uh, explaining this in such a way. Uh, I don't quite understand the fundamentals of the uh, hash space signature quite yet. But you were able to explain very well how to handle the practical side of things. I would like to learn more about the uh, fundamentals of the hash space signature. What resources would you recommend to, uh, to read up on? So there are two RFCs where they, they describe uh, the, um, the, the, the algorithms. So one of these algorithms is this LMS algorithm yeah. and the XMSS algorithm. These are the two standardized ones. There's a standard from NIST, a, a document um, where they describe the algorithm in the same way, but specify um, certain parameter sets that are allowed to be used, mm -hmm. because you can, of course, think about changing the, the hash uh, function, for example, using SHA-2, SHA-3, whatever uh, you can imagine. Um, so this, these are, let's say, the maybe not introductory papers, but the, they have all the information inside there. And I think, I'm not sure about crypto books. There's, I think, a good lecture online from uh, from Tanja Lange. She explains all the these certain steps. Uh, I think on maybe even YouTube, a video uh, thing, and maybe she also has some some kind of of, uh, of writing about that. Okay. What's uh, the, the name? Andreas Hulsing. So Andreas Hulsing will also be speaking today in the next session actually in this room about, uh, but uh, on a different topic. Okay, thank you. So Simone, you also had a question? Oh, uh, it was answered already. Uh, hi, so uh, there's some algorithms that allow for multi-trees, like for example, in XMFS. Um, and in order to solve the disaster recovery use case, can we just uh, use multi-tree variants uh, and split multi-trees over different HSMs? And then if one HSM dies, I still have trees on other HSMs, subtrees on other HSMs I can use to sign. Yeah, this is in principle also possible, but you lose some kind of efficiency. So for the for the IoT, so, so the really hardcore use case, we see that you really want to go to the single tree approach. To reduce the the size of the public key as, as or, and the signature, for example, and the signature as as my, as most as you can. So this is why um, you rarely see the multi-tree approach in these in these scenarios. And of course, the multi-tree approach is also some kind of recommendation uh, from agencies yeah, to to cover uh, or to address this problem. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. So thank you very much. I see there's quite a lot of interest in uh, stateful hash space. Okay, one more question then. <laughs> <laughs> um, to me, LMS and XMS are quite similar. Could you set a, put a word on why I should use one over the other? Uh, there's an, a nice paper about this, comparing these two algorithms. Um, and the result is, I think, more or less they are comparable in the, in the sense. There are some from the security perspective, there are different security models used in, in, the, in the proof. 
but in the end, it's uh, from a, from an application perspective, they are completely comparable. The size is very a bit, few bytes more here, a few bytes less there, but it, in principle, it's the same. And this is what we also see: it's people go for the LMS because they read the paper first, and then the other one goes for the examiner because the same reason. So there's no real distinction from from our perspective, not from the implementational aspect and not from the security perspective. In today's complex, fast-paced world, you need a partner who can help secure your digital transformation so you can drive your business forward confidently. Someone who can fine-tune and integrate the secure technologies that enable mobile identities, digital payments, and a hybrid workforce. You need a partner who will have your back so you can stay focused on the road ahead and accelerate your organization's growth. Entrust, securing a world in motion.